Good morning. Um, Susie, Alex, thank you. Um, I'm Herb Smith. Um, I'm uh, very happy to be here uh, this morning. Um, is uh, screen sharing enabled? I need to put a PowerPoint up. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, so um, uh, I'm Herb Smith, or we're, um, uh, I don't usually get a chance to use my Hebrew name, Leib Ben Avram Yosef. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, Susie. Thank you, Alex. Um, I uh, was uh, delighted when I was given this opportunity. Um, I don't talk a lot about age structure of populations, but I've been thinking a lot about age structure of populations. I'm going to talk, uh, share some general views, uh, I hope fairly quickly, because afterwards we'll have a real expert on the age structures of population, uh, Ron Lee, and I'm really interested uh, in hearing more from Ron. Um, so uh, I want to just start, uh, my, my uh, competence, as Alex mentioned, is in demography. Uh, demography is a great subject insofar as we know that the compositions of populations, including their age structures, are completely functions of rates in the past. And of course, in this case, it's rates of fertility uh, and rates of mortality. And the nice thing that we can do as demographers is, is that with fairly few assumptions, we can look fairly far into the future and see what the age structures might look like. And uh, if I had one takeaway message um, from uh, what I want to uh, talk about today, uh, it's that uh, everything we're talking about now is new. We in the world are going places uh, where we have never been before. Uh, to see this, I grabbed um, here uh, from uh, our world in data, from the UN Population Division, a really fascinating picture to me that's uh, an age, uh, set of age structures. The dark blue one in the interior is what the world looked like in 1950, about the time everybody started worrying about uh, rapid population growth. You can see there were a lot of young people at the bottom, and if you look up toward the top, not so many old people. Uh, and then you can look and see what's happened since then geologically. Um, when we switch from green to yellow, we're basically at the present, about 2018. Uh, the key point here, which is circled in red right now, is that the world is not going to be adding that many younger people relative to what it has now going into 2100. Israel, Israel perhaps, but the rest of the world not. Whereas, and this is the part that's just incredible and unprecedented in human history by a long shot, uh, is that there are going to be more and more older folks. If you take all of that yellow material out there, which will be around in 2100, there are more old people who will be around uh, in 2100 than there were essentially uh, people in the world when everybody started worrying about uh, rapid population growth, or at least as many. Uh, this stuff is just unprecedented. We have never seen this before in human history. Um, so what does this all mean? Uh, you know, the answer is, is that we don't really know what it means. Um, I said already, demography is very good at getting compositions from rates. We know a little bit less, or I should say a lot less, uh, about what uh, the different compositions have to do for rate with rates, which is another way of saying the way we look, our age structure and so on, how does that uh, deal, how does that impinge on how we behave? And if you can see my slides, you'll see that, uh, you know, uh, this is not something that only demographers can answer. Everybody's going to have to work on this. Um, and as I say here, this is just not my weak wave at disciplinary ecumenicism. I can't even pronounce it, ecumenicism. Maybe it sounds better in Hebrew. Uh, it also reflects the fact that we're going to need help because we really have never been here before as humans. So uh, there's a lot to know because there's a lot uh, that we don't know. Let me, let me try to give you a picture of what I'm talking about here. Um, this is a age sex pyramid for a, a developed country that's very different from Israel. This is Japan. Uh, Japan is very different from Israel for a lot of reasons. There's no immigration to speak of. Um, 
this is in 2020. Japan, as you can see, is already an old population, not so many people at the low ages at the bottom of the pyramid, lots of people in the middle, uh, you're starting to grow at the top. I'm just going to fast forward here for a moment. There's 2030, there's 2050. In 2050, there'll be more people at 75 to 79 than any other age group. 2060, it starts to get, um, here's 2075, I'm going to quit there. You can see there's lots of people over the age of 60 and not so many people under them. Again, Japan's the extreme case, but it's, it's worth looking at for a moment. Uh, and uh, this is my transition here between what demographers know and what the rest of us need to think about as uh, members of the societies that demographers uh, look at. When I looked at this picture, I looked up at the top, there's about 1% of the people will be over 100 years old. Uh, one of the things I got to thinking about is, is that if you have uh, in Japan in 2075, a new girl baby uh, uh, who, who's born there, um, one of the things is, is that the moment she's born, um, she's going to have two great grandmothers. Um, the woman on the right, I guess, was the oldest woman in the world at the time, 116. The woman on the left had just set some kind of uh, swimming record. Um, and you could say, well, gee, that's really kind of interesting, but so what? Uh, the so what is, is I don't have a picture, but there's some mother in the middle. And at that moment, um, that's her dependency ratio. She has to go to uh, one of her grandmother's swim meets, another of her grandmother's birthday parties, uh, and she has a newborn. And you can say, well, that's all very cute, but of course there's a bunch of old people and then they have lots and lots of grandkids. No, no, that's not what's going on here. You get another girl baby, you get another two great grandmothers. There's a lot of old people relative to the new dependents who are coming in uh, to the population. Uh, most of the old people are female. Uh, this man's a hundred and year old physician. There are occasionally some grandfathers, um, but uh, that's another world. Um, I just pause here briefly to say I'm a sociologist, not an economist. Those of you who uh, learn from economics know all the time that economists talk about agents, rational actors, and so on. Nothing wrong with that. Um, in sociology, it's not just that we think people are connected to other people, living in groups, families, and so on, but there's also this whole question about how human identities are formed, and they're formed in relation to other people, and we'll be in societies in which the, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the weight of other people is drastically shifted toward older people, and uh, I don't know what that's going to be like. In fact, uh, I mentioned to Alex that I often find myself thinking that an aged society is in some way a contradiction in terms. Um, I don't want to get into the kind of, um, I don't know if it's anthropomorphism, uh, the thing that says, oh, well, there are societies that are dynamic and there are societies that are stagnant and so on. Um, but I do think we have to think about what goes on in people's heads in the different kind of societies that they live in if we want to understand uh, how they act. Um, it's not obvious, and this is going to, I'm going to get, take a, take a long detour, but this is going to get to Israel in a moment. It's not obvious that you can read from an age structure uh, into um, what, what's going on in the world. So we know from the work of Ron Lee and others that, that historically wealth in human societies has been on balance from the old to the young. Now here's the sociological part. Perhaps in return, a lot of the squishier stuff, I say squishy, um, but they're real social and psychological goods, things like respect, prestige, precedence, deference. These have tended to attach to older folks. And why have they attached to older folks? Well, um, you know, it's squishy stuff because it's hard to pin down. And maybe we haven't tried that hard to pin down what respect, prestige, and so on are all about because it's not so hard to generate it when the number of people you have to give it to are numerically few. When the number of people you have to give it to is numerically large, you have to start wondering how much of this stuff is really lying around. Uh, one of the things I'm going to suggest, I hope a little provocatively, is that as the age structure changes, the chance of what I'm calling here an intergenerational jujitsu, where the older folks use the younger folks' good manners against them, increases. I'm not going to say that Ron says this, but 
when Ron and his colleagues have shown now that there are some societies that for the first time in history have upward net wealth flows from the young to the old, I'm telling you, I'm not so surprised. We've, we've created the conditions for that kind of intergenerational jujitsu. Getting back to my point, moving on toward Israel, that there's nothing necessarily that can be read into age structures. I just want to go through a few things. Um, let's take, for example, support for adherence to the European Union. That's not Israel. Um, we know in England, for example, we have Brexit. It's fairly well known that Brexit was a vote in which older places tended to vote to get out. Younger places wanted to stay in. And there's no end of people have pointed out that's a fairly weird thing where a lot of people who are not going to be around forever uh, get to decide on the futures of other people who are if not are going to be around forever, at least are going to be around for um, some length of time. Um, some people say, well, the younger people should have voted more, but, uh, but on my reading, it's really the age structure. Even if the younger people had voted more, um, they wouldn't have been able to override the people who sort of said, We've had enough immigrants, we've had enough this, we've had enough that, uh, let's get out. So you could say, well, okay, you have older people, you're gonna have more isolationism, this certain kind of populism, but uh, you can't really tell, other things can go other ways. The reason uh, I, I like this is, is that um, I was also reading a book by a guy named Emmanuel Todd, a Frenchman, um, who's uh, known for, among other things, uh, 45 years ago predicting on the basis of demography the demise of the Soviet Union. It's a book about something that uh, we don't have to go into too much. It's about uh, class warfare in this century in France. Um, you can look at these things at some other time. Um, he said, look, there's just uh, France is uh, shrinking economically and so on. Uh, there's nothing but hostility across the classes and whatnot. People need to um, um, essentially do what their German masters tell them and so on. I'm just pushing ahead here because uh, when we asked, when he asked the question, how did France get to this point? Um, he said, well, you know, it's the embrace of the Euro. The Euro's the original sin. Once they got tied to the Euros, the Germans and the bankers got to dictate everything. Nobody can do anything about this. Why not? Let's get back to the topic here. Aging, aging of the French population. Retirees uh, understand that retreat from the Euro would mean the erosion of their pension, inflation, and so on. Uh, and his point is, is that between the early 1990s and the present, the rapid aging of the French population created a situation in which nobody was willing anymore to question France's adherence to the European Monetary Union. So to go back for a minute, you get people getting older in England, it shuts down young people for the future in Brexit. You get people getting older in France, it seems to be shutting down any discussion of uh, changes in fiscal and monetary policy. Um, so one place you get out of Europe, the other place you have to stay in. You just have to try to take these things on their own terms. Which brings me quickly to the little I'm going to say here about Israel. I'll learn more from you during the course of the day. You guys have, as has already been pointed out, a comparatively young age structure for a developed economy. I just wanted to be the first person to to show your age sex pyramid here. Uh, it's a very nice looking one. It's actually a pyramid. Um, it's balanced, it's less aged than most. If we just run through a little bit in time, even as uh, we move through the 21st century, uh, you're still gonna have a fair number of people at the bottom, not so many people at the top. Maybe Japan, Germany, uh, France, Britain, maybe that's all irrelevant for you. And that could well be. You'll always have people at the bottom producing, uh, except for the following. Um, you know, there's people and there's people. It depends on what people's connections are to society. Um, you do have uh, much higher fertility. I, I, I listened to the podcast in which I participated. It's not just the Israeli Arab population. It's not just the uh, ultra Orthodox population. You do have uh, generally higher fertility even among the more secular population in Israel. I'm gonna move on because everybody listening knows more about this than I do. 
Um, but it's also the case that especially among the ultra-Orthodox population in Europe, uh, I'm, I'm using a 20-year-old article here that I've quoted by uh, Eli Berman, um, but uh, the, the high fertility in Israel among um, uh, the ultra-Orthodox has a heck of a lot to do um, with people who are not contributing to labor supply. Um, in Berman's paper, he compares the ultra-Orthodox um, in, in the same sect, same rabbi um, in Israel and the United States and shows that the Israeli system just allows a lot uh, uh, higher fertility with non-economically productive activity and social segregation. And as to whether having a lot of young people in these categories is necessarily going to spare you from the problems that people are having with older populations in, say, England or France, uh, it's just not that clear. So I'm just going to say that, move along, and I'll learn more about Israel uh, later in the day. Um, the nub of the problem that's facing all of us is, is that the age structure is by definition a feature of a population in the cross-section at a particular point in time. Now, there are ways to adapt the new age structures. Um, the next bullet point is everything Ron Lee has written about for years and years now. I'll let him do that. The problem, of course, is that the present, the now, is ever exigent. It, it, it's always demanding on us, it, as particularly in the political realm, and in ways that'll be confounded with new age structures. This is nothing new. The point has been made before. Um, you, there has to be some trust between generations. Uh, like I said, it's been pointed out. This was in the, uh, 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 the National Transfer Accounts Manual. I took this from, from Ron Lee and Andy Mason. Um, so this is all well known, uh, but you have to be thinking about it all the time um, because the uh, present try tends to uh, kill the best plans for the future. Um, I worked a lot on family planning in China once upon a time. I, I just saw this slide, which I've stolen from my pen, uh, uh, with, with his permission, my pen econ colleague, uh, Henming Fang, um, who uh, took some newspaper headlines. I was working in the early 1990s in China. China, of course, had a one-child fa uh, family, uh, one-child uh, 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 policy for, for children. Everybody knew at the time that was going to create trouble somewhere down the road unless people planned ahead. The government planned to plan ahead. In 1985, you can see this here. Um, if your Chinese is no better than my Hebrew, it says, it's glorious to have one child. The government will pay for your retirement. Okay, that's good. By the time I was working there, it's glorious to have one child. The government will help pay for your retirement. Well, I think you know where this is going. In 2005, you learn you can't really rely entirely on the government for your retirement. And in 2012, you're told you better keep working because essentially you have no retirement. This is, you know, just something I have fun with, but you could see it coming and there it is. This is how things happen. Um, just again, to, to highlight some things that are sort of fun to look at. This is my uh, friend and French colleague, Louis Chauvel. There's something called generational capture. There's a problem, which is, is that there's lots of roles that you can only have a certain number of people in at any one point in time. And as populations change, sometimes some generations grab things and hold on to them. This is the French National Assembly. Uh, in 1947, uh, way too many people had been compromised um, by collaboration with the Nazis. So uh, the French Assembly was very, very young. That's the Red Group. Uh, the largest number of people in the Assembly were in their 30s. Look what happens as life moves on after this. The assembly tends to be full of the same people year after year after year. Um, by, the, uh, by, the, by the 70s and so on, things are getting older and older. Um, there's some generations that are darker that just seem to monopolize everything. So in France, in the early, in the 1950s, for example, in the assembly, there was a uh, one deputy over age 60 for every one under age 40. By our 21st century, of course, it's full of wisdom. There's nine deputies over 60 for every deputy under 40. Um, I don't know. You could say what you want, think what you want about that. I think it's a little sad. Um, all right. So 
When Alex asked me to talk about all of this, it was, I don't know, sometime back uh, early in 2020, or maybe it was even in 2019, and there was no such thing as COVID. And of course, the fact that I'm speaking to you from Paris and you're listening in Jerusalem or Australia or Berkeley or someone, everybody knows about COVID. Um, but COVID, I think, is, uh, oof, well, you know, it's, it's the story of our times. Uh, but it, it, it came along uh, to, to emphasize what I had been worrying about all the time, that having aging societies opens us up for all kinds of conflict that we don't even understand. Uh, COVID-19, as it turns out, is a disease of aging. I mean, that's what COVID-19 is. It's all about aging. Um, I'm stealing some of these data from an excellent paper uh, that, that, that was written uh, based on English data. It's in the journal Nature. Uh, basically, it's population-based in the sense that they took um, records from the health system, which were very good, and matched them to mortality. You can see on the right-hand side here to emphasize males who seem to be most affected or more affected uh, by this disease, um, that mortality is so much higher among 80-year-olds than among younger people. In fact, you know, in just a couple of months, um, you're losing close to 1% uh, of the 80-year-old population in England to COVID among males. Uh, this is... Uh, non-trivial to say the least uh, in human terms and demographic terms and any other kind of terms you want to say. But it's a disease of aging. I've said that once, I've said that twice, it's up there again. What I'm fascinated by all the time is how many people in journalism and in public health and whatever want to talk about this as though it's anything other than a disease of aging. So of course, what you tend to hear about all the time is social inequality, pre-existing medical conditions, and so on. Um, but that's not what's really going on here. It's a disease of aging. It's just something that hits us as we grow older. Um, the effects are enormous. I realize this is going to be very hard to see here, but at the top, the, these are the effects of age. Um, as you move out to the right, it's, you know, 10 times, 100 times uh, more deadly. The uh, arrow down the, I'm sorry, the red line down the middle is for 50-year-olds. Um, as you go to the left, you're getting to younger people. For some reason, they didn't want to talk about how little uh, mortal, how low mortality was for the 18 to 39-year-olds. You can't even see that on the graph. But what you can see here visually, because the horizontal displacement of the points is the effects of these various um, factors, what you can see here is, is that even when you take into account smoking, ethnicity, social deprivation, previous cancer, asthma, and so on, age tends to be what's affecting mortality. And it's what's affecting our behavior, it's what's affecting our policy choices, it's what's affecting our understanding of things, it's what's affecting our relations with others, our social relations, our family relations, and so on. It's age, age, age. All the rest of this stuff, I'm not saying it's not important, I'm not saying you shouldn't tell your physician about pre-existing conditions, but at a demographic and a social level, did I say this before? It's all about age. Um, here, I've, I've, I've uh, made it a little more readable. Age, big displacement horizontally, everything else, smoking, ethnicity, diabetes, uh, not so much uh, by comparison. Um, so I've said it here already, um, just moving from your 50s to your 60s has the same effect as uh, great social deprivation, has the same effect as, as, as obesity. I think I've said this before, it's a disease of aging. Just in case I didn't, uh, I wanted to uh, make some graphs here. Um, on the left-hand side, it's the ratio of mortality for uh, various age groups relative to young people, relative to people 18 to 39 years old. So you can see that the 50 and 59 year olds are a little over 10 times as likely to die. Um, the blue lines are from this article. It's the relative uh, mortality from COVID. Uh, as I've said, it's not just about pre-existing conditions. If you adjust to, for the pre-existing conditions, you get the orange bars. It's still very high. 
If we look at the 70 to 79 year olds, essentially their mortality is about a hundred times. That's what's known as two orders of magnitude greater than the 18 to 39 year olds. Um, people say, okay, Herb, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a disease of aging, but we all know as you get older, you die more often. And that's exactly right, except that it's even fiercer for COVID than it is for normal aging. The stuff that usually kills us, the cancer, the heart disease. Uh, the gray area here are the life tables for England. That is to say before COVID, these were the risks of dying with by age. Um, and it was nowhere near as high uh, as it is with COVID. COVID is a disease of aging and we have not quite gotten our heads around that as we try to deal with this. Um, I'm not saying what we should do. I have no idea. I've got my own personal preferences. I'm, uh, I'm talking to you from a basement. So obviously uh, I'm not trying to catch the stuff. Uh, what people should do, I don't know exactly, but it's really creating uh, issues in aging societies. Um, again, just to see how big this is, I've changed the um, um, left-hand side from the log scale to, to, to just the general scale. Uh, and you can see that uh, it's just not so much a risk for younger people. Um, I uh, have uh, children who are young adults or maybe not so young adults in the 18 to 39 year old group. I don't want them to get sick. But the plain truth is, is that uh, people are beginning to understand that uh, in terms of risks, it's not that big a risk for young people. Um, here's some data I just wanted to pull from the country I'm living in right now, um, France. We don't really know in the first wave in March and April um, what the distribution was, like how the, how the epidemic spread by age. There's a lot of ideas, but there wasn't as much testing. Um, if you look over to the left side, that S23, that's for week 23, that would have been in something like June. Rates for low for all age groups, if anything, they were a little higher for the older folks, 75 years and older. And of course, what happened since then during the summer and whatnot is, is that on the basis of experience, young people discovered that uh, in general, in general, I want to apologize in advance. I know that people are young who are listening. I know there are people, it's always possible someone knows someone who has gotten deadly ill with this at a young age. I do not mean to minimize this. I, at a personal level, it is always very sad, but at a population level, it's just not a big deal for the young people. And they know that. And you can see this in France. Um, they quit doing what was needed to be done to keep away from the virus. I'm not blaming them, I'm simply reporting. Now, of course, a lot of people imagine that you can say, okay, let them uh, get sick and then we'll have herd immunity or something, but it doesn't really work that way. If you look to the right, you can see that eventually in France, the disease has started to uh, pick up again uh, among older folks as well, because of course we're not, uh, you know, we, we are in the same uh, society and uh, and there it is. And of course, this is going on in other countries. I just happen to have data from France. Um, I'm talking as though I'm preaching. I don't mean to pre preach, but I think we have to be honest about what is happening. Um, when you're getting to uh, to to to, to uh, issues where 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 the risk is so high relative in one age group to the other, the risk reward ratio and so on. Um, I don't know, I mean, I, I, I read the New York Times, I read the Washington Post. Um, I, I'll admit in my life, I've never voted for a Republican. I'm not a uh, conservative, uh, but I'm always fascinated by how these um, people are picking information and so on. Uh, almost to try to convince young people uh, of something that demographically is probably not so true. This is a problem for old people. We're going to have to figure out how to deal with it as we have older and older societies. Again, these are the things that are coming. I, I blathered on about it because it's our current reality and, and it's an instantiation of something I'd worried about, even though I didn't know what I was worrying about. All right, look, it's time to wrap up. Uh, I'm gonna go back to where I have a little bit of knowledge 
uh, and then make some speculative uh, philosophical remarks. Uh, so my little bit of uh, knowledge has to do with demography. Um, demography, my subject matter, uh, was founded at the junction of the inexorable and the apocalyptic. Uh, it sounds biblical, but there it is. Uh, it's not the Bible. Uh, it sounds like the Bible. It was written by a minister. This is Thomas Malthus. The power of population is so superior to the power of the earth to produce subsistence for man that premature death must in some shape or other visit the human race. Uh, this created my field, demography. We were always trying to understand the extent to which it was true. And insofar as many of us got into the field because of high fertility, the question was, uh, how do you avoid the whole thing? Um, What's interesting now is that with aged societies and the selfishness of the now, I'm not talking about the selfishness of the aged or the selfishness of the young, I'm talking about the selfishness of the now, the present. Um, it's a real problem in aged societies because the only way to deal with aged societies is to think very far ahead. Uh, and the problem is, is that there's a conceit. It's the human conceit. It's the illusion that I referenced in the title of my talk. Uh, it's the illusion of immortality. Um, Malthus talked about premature death. He didn't say we have to avoid death. He was worried about premature death. I've already uh, cited Emmanuel Todd in that book that I took the, the stuff about uh, the, the French commitment to the Euro from. He also has some very interesting things about what happens in societies with great deal of economic inequality. And he said, throughout human history, uh, part of what elites have done is try to get rid of not premature death, but death altogether, uh, the illusion of, uh, of, of immortality. And the illusion of immortality is uh, something we've got to get, uh, we, we have to rid ourselves of because uh, it, it uh, creates uh, conditions that don't let us think about the real future of the societies. It's certainly more fun to imagine we're gonna live forever, at least it's less unpleasant, uh, but socially it's very, very dangerous. It's something that worries me a heck of a lot. I've been a fellow traveler in a long, for a long time and people who are talking about how great it is as societies age and you know, 80 is the new 60 or whatever and so on. But uh, as, as COVID will tell you, it's not like that. We really need to think differently about the future. Um, I'm going to stop now so that we can hear, actually hear from somebody who has some real data. Uh, I just want to thank you. Uh, let me just try here. Um, Moshana Haba Aha Ba Yisraelim. Next year in Jerusalem, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Herb. Um, if you can close down your your video now, that'd be great. Um, um, that that was fun and engaging, and and now, like like, like you say, we're we're, we're going to proceed to some real real data. Um, um, I'm I'm um, I'm very very privileged to uh, um, to introduce Professor Ron Lee from the University of California at uh, at Berkeley. Um, Ron Lee, am amongst other things, along with Andrew Mason, as he'll explain, is 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 the founder of the National Transfer Accounts Project, and that and that um, that provides us with a fantastic tool for being able to measure the like the effects of population um, in combination with economic um, performance, um, and to uh, and to gaze through that tool into the future. Ron, I'm handing over to you. So I'm, I'm very glad to uh, be in Jerusalem virtually, and of course I would much rather be there uh, physically, but uh, it's not to be. And it was a pleasure and uh, very stimulating to hear Herb Smith's um, deep, wise, and philosophical thoughts about uh, these issues. And now uh, we're going to plunge into demographic uh, nitty gritty with all its possibly exaggerated promise of 
concrete uh, uh, calculation. But let's let's press on with it. Uh, so um, I'm first going to start with some words about national transfer counts and uh, explain what uh, what this is about, and then we'll go to looking at some estimates. So, as I'm sure you all know, uh, there's been a lot of dramatic change in population age distributions over the last uh, century or so, and there will be another century of uh, uh, dramatic changes coming in the future. And these are the result, as Herb told us, of past changes in the vital rates. Now, some countries that are in the middle of the demographic transition are experiencing what are called demographic dividends. They have, because their fertility is declining, they have declining child dependency, they have an increasing share of the labor force in the population, and as a consequence, their per capita income and per capita consumption is rising because of the demographic change. This is called the demographic dividend. But at a later stage, fertility gets to a low level, mortality continues to decline, and we have population aging. And population aging is like a negative demographic dividend. The share of the population in older ages rises, the dependency load on the economy rises, and basically the increased uh, benefits of the demographic dividend are reversed and returned to where things started. On top of these long-run changes, there may be fluctuations, baby booms and baby busts and so on. And so we're interested in the question of what the economic consequences of these changes may be. And of course, these are extremely complicated uh, questions and nobody really knows the answers. But if we focus on the sort of pure demographic impact, uh, asking if the world remained kind of as it is now in terms of the way people behave at different ages and so on, what would these, what would population aging mean? What would declining share of children in the population mean to the economy? Well, we can answer that kind of question. Okay, are you, you seeing this schematic of the economic life cycle? Yes, That's we are. Correct. That's correct. Okay, all right. So, uh, well, a, a simple picture just to illustrate that in childhood and old age, uh, people consume more than they produce through labor income. And in between, they produce a surplus above what they consume. And then that surplus is uh, redistributed in one way or another to the young and to the old. Now, that schematic is now replaced by an actual estimate for Israel of consumption by age and labor income by age, and we'll be coming back to this picture uh, over and over. Um, but you see childhood and old age and probably nothing surprising. Um, okay, now how is income reallocated? How is it redistributed? Well, there are different mechanisms. The mechanisms for shifting income across time or across age the mechanisms are through capital or financial markets, through public transfers, through private transfers, or through borrowing and lending. And then each of these uh, mechanisms can take place through either the family, through the market, or through the public sector. 
And uh, NTA, National Transfer Accounts, seeks to estimate all these different flows of resources across age uh, through these different mechanisms and through each institution. That's what we set out to do. There's an emphasis on transfers, and we find that about 50% of GDP is redistributed across age through public or private transfers. So it's massively important. And effects of age, population age distribution arise particularly through the way transfers are shaped in each society. Here is the scope of the NTA project now, shown in the map. Um, as uh, Alex said, this was started by Andy Mason and myself uh, nearly 20 years ago, and it's grown as a project from the seven countries we started with to now there are over 70 uh, member countries, and uh, they're shown in the dark gray. And then the orange countries have had NTA uh, estimates done, but they don't have their own teams. Uh, they're not member countries. And then the light gray are countries, uh, areas that don't have NTA right now. NTA, uh, doesn't go out and run its own surveys. We use existing data sources, expenditure surveys, labor surveys, censuses, administrative data, national income and product accounts, many different kinds of data, and we have a methodology for processing them. And has, as Herb uh, showed earlier, there's a United Nations manual now that describes and presents these methods so that uh, other people can uh, use them. Now, the starting point in NTA is calculating age profiles, as we call them. And um, an age profile is an average across the whole population at a given age. And the basic and in the basic NTA, there uh, males and females are combined. It's uh, uh, we don't do it separately by sex. So, for example, uh, the consumption age profile that we just saw for Israel includes private household consumption expenditures, which are then allocated, imputed to individuals at each age within each household using a set of procedures I'm not going to uh, describe. And then in addition, it includes public in-kind transfers, such as public education, uh, publicly provided health care, publicly provided long-term care, uh, but not money transfers, such as public pensions, which could be used for anything. Uh, consumption would be only one possibility. It would be double counting to include that. So that's consumption. Um, and then labor income is again averaged across everyone, whether they have a zero labor income or positive, um, males and females. And it includes wages and salaries and fringe benefits. Uh, and it also includes two thirds of self employment income, the other third. Uh, is allocated to asset income. And uh, for many of the countries, self-employment income is what 70% of the labor force has in, in agricultural societies. Um, the NTA accounts are calculated in a way that is consistent with standard national income and product accounts. So that if, for example, you multiplied the labor income age profile by the population age distribution and added it up, you would find it exactly equaled uh, labor income in the national income and product accounts by construction. And then for purposes of comparing countries, as we'll be doing in a moment, we generally divide 
uh, the age profile by average labor income in the country between ages 30 and 49. We try to pick ages that are after education and before early retirement. Okay, so um, here is Israel. This is the same age profile I showed earlier for uh, labor income. Israel is the heavy brown line here. And uh, I'm showing a comparison to a bunch of other um, high income countries, mostly European, US, Japan. And a couple of things stand out. First of all, it's remarkable how similar this all is, uh, remarkable to me. Um, but a couple of differences stand out here for Israel. And one is uh, this, uh, in the 20s and early 30s, uh, labor income is surprisingly low relative to that 30 to 49 year old, uh, 30 to 49 average. I'm not sure what that's about. I'd be interested to hear Alex or others uh, offer explanations. But it's also striking that uh, in Israel, there continues to be strong labor income late into the 60s. You see here it's higher than in any of these other countries. And in the 70s as well, where it's also high in the US. But uh, this is a striking aspect of uh, labor income in Israel. And it also means because people continue to work uh, so much longer in Israel than say in Spain or Germany or France or Italy, uh, it also means that the effects of population aging are somewhat muted because the elderly are continuing to work longer. Okay, so that's uh, labor income. And now here we have consumption. Um, same countries. The situation of Israel, again, this brown line, it's not as distinctively different as was for labor income. But uh, you see that uh, there's very high consumption by children in Israel, uh, perhaps the highest at uh, the younger ages. And this is, I think, uh, reflecting high expenditure on public education per, per child in Israel. And then uh, you see this brown line continuing uh, fairly level until uh, the late 50s and 60s and 70s when it rises modestly. Now I say it rises modestly because if you compare it to the US, the gray line or Sweden up here or Japan, uh, consumption by the elderly is relatively lower in, in Israel. And that also, uh, at least relative to countries like the US or Sweden or Japan, somewhat mutes the effect of uh, population aging in Israel. So here we have a, uh, again, the uh, Israel, Israeli uh, profiles. Um, this is labor income consumption. This is asset income, the gray line, and the yellow line is savings uh, rates by age. Uh, and we have a number of countries here, and I'm just going to compare some of these. Here we have the labor income for Israel, and you see how symmetric uh, it is, how sort of regular that curve looks. Sweden, you see, is shoved a bit to the, to the right towards older ages. Japan, even more strongly, is uh, the age profile of labor earning is shoved to the right by their seniority system of uh, wages. Senegal is quite symmetric like Israel, but you see work starts at uh, age five or six and continues way into old age. And then China is very interesting. You see this pattern also in countries like Vietnam or Cambodia that have very rapid economic growth, very rapid recent increase in higher education, and the young adults are the ones getting the new jobs in the formal sector, moving to the cities and earning a great deal. The elderly continue to work hard, but they earn almost nothing 
relative to the young. So it's a dis uh, distinctive. Okay. Um, consumption, well, we've already talked a bit about that. It's, uh, you see the US, how it's tilted steeply upwards. Thailand is uh, gradually downwards and Israel is somewhere in between. Um, here we have asset income, which I think is quite important. Now, fortunately, these graphs have different vertical scales, but uh, the Israeli asset income, this gray line, approaches half of prime age labor income for those in their 70s, uh, which is quite high. It's much higher than in Germany. Uh, it's much higher than in Hungary. It's fairly similar to Japan but not as high as uh, Costa Rica. Now, the point of having high asset income and for the elderly to be relying on asset income to fund their consumption is that it eases the, um, the economic impact of population aging to the, to the extent that then elderly are essentially uh, supporting themselves to a considerable extent. So in, in a country with substantial asset income, it's reflecting a substantial stock of asset holdings at older ages. And uh, on the one hand, yes, that eases the uh, support burden for the elderly. And on the other hand, it can mean more capital per worker and higher labor productivity and higher wages in the economy. Okay, now these age profiles, um, of course, are not written in stone, and they're not pure products of the culture of each country. Um, and although they tend to be quite stable from year to year, from decade to decade, they, they can certainly vary, and they vary in systematic ways. And you see here for the U.S. a picture which I think uh, is probably common, fairly common for uh, some European countries, and it might be true of Israel as well. I don't know. But in 19, this is what we're seeing here is consumption by age, age on the horizontal axis. And uh, these are different components of co consumption that are shown. But if you just look at the top, you see that in 1960, after age 60 or so, uh, consumption by the elderly declined strongly. But by 1981, that was no longer true. And consumption by the elderly now began to, uh, ra to rise throughout the adult years. And it's rising primarily because of this growing orange wedge, which is publicly provided health care. That's US Medicare health care for the elderly and Medicaid health care for the poor. And the green is also a growing wedge. That's private health care expenditures. And together, they account for almost all the increase in consumption by the elderly between 1960 and 81, relatively speaking. And then in 2011, you see how this trend has continued and been amplified. And in fact, between 2011 and 1960, the ratio of consumption by an 80-year-old to that of a 20-year-old has doubled. So at the same time that these societies are aging, the cost of an old person is also increasing. There's a double uh, impact, a double economic impact of population aging because of the way these age profiles are changing. And of course, if I showed the age profile of labor income, you uh, over time like this, and I went back to the beginning of the century, you'd see that the age of retirement uh, has dropped by 10 or 12 years since 1900. And only recently, since the mid 1990s, has the age of retirement begun to uh, creep upwards in the US and in OECD countries in general. I'm not sure what the situation in Israel is. But that also, the fact that uh, labor income at older ages has declined so severely uh, also makes population aging more costly. Now let's look at population aging uh, in Israel. And uh, we have very careful work by Alex Weinreb here and uh, 
I think, in doing the projections, uh, uh, collaborators. And you can see, uh, well, we all know uh, fertility in Israel is high. Uh, they go up to 2040 and hesitated to go beyond because uh, there's so much uncertainty about the future of uncertainty of, of fertility, and there's no question about it. Um, but I want to look farther into the future, and I'm going to use the UN medium projections, which you can see are showing fertility decline about the same rate as Alex's projections, but <clears throat> um, they're about a quarter of a child lower. That may not look like much in this graph, but a quarter of a child difference, in fact, makes a big difference as fertility approaches replacement level. Uh, a quarter of a child makes a difference of half percent per year in uh, population growth rate and has a big effect on population aging and such. Okay, so by using the UN projections uh, may well be overstating the extent of population aging in Israel and understating the extent of declining child dependency. Now, if we compare this to uh, fertility in average high income countries, uh, as we all know, uh, Israel, Israeli fertility is much higher. It's about twice as high as the 1.67 in, uh, uh, according to the UN in the World Bank high income countries. And this was true if we go back to 1950, uh, Israeli fertility was twice or 50% higher than that in the high income countries, and there's a continuation. Uh, okay, now that's going to mean there are two things here. First of all, we're going to have declining uh, child dependency in Israel, where we're not, whereas we're not going to have this in, in the, the uh, other high income countries. And we're also not going to have as great population aging. Uh, We'll see that in a moment. Here we have the child dependency ratio for Israel declining through from 2020 through 2100, according to UN projections. And here we have the child dependency in high income countries. At the same time uh, that child dependency is declining, uh, old age dependency is rising. These are by standard uh, demographic dependency measures. We'll go to something more elaborate in a moment. But you can see that particularly if we focus on the, to the mid-century 2050 or 2060, uh, aging is happening much faster in the high income countries and reaching a much higher level. And uh, all right. Now, if you add these together, you get the total dependency ratio which you see is rising in the high income countries because child dependency isn't falling and uh, population aging is proceeding. But in Israel, they're pretty much offsetting uh, and it's a fairly flat line. Now we might wonder, um, are children and elderly really equally costly as dependents? Should we be just adding them together as is done in these demographic dependency ratios? Uh, perhaps we should be weighting them differently. And we might ask our ages 20 and 65 appropriate uh, boundaries for, for defining the working population. Well, uh, we might also wonder are all workers equally productive? So it's uh, taking these kinds of considerations into account that uh, makes NTA useful. And uh, so let's look at what are called support ratios for Israel and high income countries. Support ratios are like an upside down dependency ratio, but these are also weighted by the age profiles for labor income and consumption that I showed you earlier. That is, we, we multiply the age profile for labor income times the population age distribution and add that up and we call that effective labor. We do the same thing for consumption and call that effective consumption and we 
find the ratio of effective labor to effective consumption. And that is the support ratio. And then we see how it changes as the population age distribution changes. Um, so here are examples of support ratios uh, based on NTA data. Uh, these are calculated for countries around the world in different uh, World Bank income groups. <clears throat> Let's just concentrate on the support ratio up here and to the right of the dashed line, that would be the present uh, up to 2060. So if we look at low income countries, we see that their support ratios are rising and rising a lot. Um, that is what I referred to earlier as the demographic dividend. And in fact, that de demographic dividend is calculated as the rate of change of the support ratio. And it can add a half a percent to 1% per year to a growth rate in consumption per consumer. Um, then we have low middle income countries and you can see their support ratios also are continuing to rise, but only slightly. And they're still experiencing a positive demographic dividend, but very slightly so. Then we have the upper middle income countries and they have already begun to age and they have declining support ratios. And uh, they have not a demographic dividend, but, uh, or a negative demographic dividend, or they're experiencing the costs of population aging. And the same for high income countries that began aging about 20 years ago. Okay, so that's uh, a bunch of comparison countries. And here we have the familiar Israeli uh, labor income and consumption profile. And we use it to calculate the Israeli support ratio. And here it is. And you can see that it is virtually uh, flat all the way out to 2100. Flat as a pancake, I, I describe it here. Well, that is surprising and none of those uh, economic groups we just looked at had support ratio changes over time that looked anything like this. They were all going up or down. And I don't know of any country I've ever seen that has a support ratio that looks so flat uh, as, as Israel. Now, another kind of support ratio is the so-called fiscal support ratio. And we can calculate that too using NTA data that comes from, I should have acknowledged this at the, at the start, but it, it comes from, uh, I don't remember the name of the lead uh, researcher, but then Alex and uh, Dove as well. Kirill, I think is the first name. Anyway. Kirill Shravaman. So this is what, what was that? Kirill Shravaman is the, is the lead, okay. is the lead estimator. Thank you. Sorry. Thanks, Ron. Thank you, Alex. Um, okay, so here we have, uh, in place of labor income, we have taxes, taxes paid uh, approximately, it's a little more complicated than that, but that will do. And uh, in place of consumption, we have the green line, which is benefits received from the government. So you might ask, how can it be that uh, children, young children are paying taxes here? Uh, that's because they're indirect taxes on children's consumption and those are allocated to children. Uh, then you see here in the benefits, curve, this interesting notch. This, of course, is public education before that. Then there's this notch, which uh, I think is uh, military service, and Alex confirmed that that's what it is. Uh, and then at older ages, we have here public transfers for public pensions, health care, long-term care, uh, leading to this big upsweep. And then uh, we have this uh, sort of uh, platform for public transfers, which is public goods that uh, every age is receiving, things like uh, the services of roads or 
the military or police or your foreign embassies or your research institutes and so on. Uh, okay, so using those, we can now calculate a fiscal support ratio, which is done here and compared to the other support ratio, when you can see there's virtually no difference at all. Well, this also is very striking. Uh, what I'm used to seeing is a fiscal support ratio dropping in uh, uh, high income country, as we saw earlier, as population aging makes these public transfers to the elderly more and more costly. Okay, um, so we have no overall cost of popu population aging that's coming this century. Uh, we also have no demographic dividend resulting from the declining fertility. They're more or less perfectly offsetting. Now, it would be a mistake to conclude the, from that, that we should all go home and why discuss the effects of demographic change on public programs and so on, um, because certainly it's going to cause population aging and uh, population age distribution changes are certainly going to cause fiscal pressures or changing fiscal environments for many specific public programs. Uh, there still be problems for public pensions, healthcare, long-term care, and so on. Those will be strongly uh, affected, with an A, uh, by population aging. Uh, and the end, we didn't go into detail in the NTA age profiles, but NTA age profiles are available for in great detail for individual programs and can be used to assess this fiscal pressure in the face of population aging. Um, so although in, if all the revenues went into one pool, and then they were allocated according to need to all the other programs, uh, then everything would be fine. But that's not the way governments and uh, budgets work. In fact, uh, fiscal pressures arise in some programs, there's uh, budgets are relaxed in others, but uh, the money doesn't uh, uh, sort of automatically flow from one to another. Okay, um, now, Alex, I've been going about 40 minutes, but much of that time was wasted in the beginning. So I'm not entirely sure um, how to proceed at this point. How would you like me to proceed? Um, I would like you to proceed in a way that you feel comfortable that you've um, covered the substance. Okay, and then well, I will go ahead, but I'll probably skip over some of this stuff. So um, I want to just talk a little bit more about the different ways that um, the gap between consumption and labor income is made up in different countries and particularly for the elderly. And here we see for the US, uh, this is the consumption minus labor income at each age and how that gap is filled. So here we have children the red are private transfers, and we see the private transfers are very important. That's just parents feeding, clothing, housing their children. And the blue is public transfers, and those, of course, are also very important uh, for children. And here we see the working age adults make, paying taxes in the blue, the negative blue, making private transfers to their children. But we also see the elderly uh, making private transfers to their grandchildren or their children. And this is completely typical of rich countries and poor countries around the world. Somehow, ex except in East Asia, where often there's fam familial support of the elderly. But in most countries, the elderly are still making net giving net assistance on average uh, to their children. And of course, this is the US, the receiving uh, public pension uh, transfers and healthcare and so on. But the purple 
uh, is also very important. That's asset income that isn't saved, that is consumed. And you can see that actually for the elderly in the US, this makes up about two thirds of what pays for their consumption. So as the population ages, the sort of the increased tax burden on the working age population is very much reduced by the fact that the elderly uh, rely on asset income rather than public transfers. But in many European countries, uh, the opposite is the case. And there's almost total reliance on public transfers. Uh, I think I'll skip this slide, which is a bit complicated. Uh, I wish I had had time to work out, perhaps Alex knows, uh, how to characterize the situation in Israel. Yes, there's substantial asset income. I think uh, probably there's substantial reliance on asset income. And my guess is it's something like the U.S. Uh, uh, case, where because people work till older ages and rely uh, somewhat less heavily on public transfers in old age, um, the impact of population aging will be softened. Now, I'm going to finish up with a few words about new directions uh, that we're moving in national transfer accounts, and then I think that'll still leave time for discussion and so on. Ron, if, I, if I may, just is, for a second. I'm, I'm sorry, Ron. Yes. Feel, um, um, feel free to take as much time as you want to, to, to cover stuff because, um, I mean, firstly, Herb left left lots of time because he was so keen to hear you, I'm sure. Um, and I mean, second, we like we have a built-in cushion as well. So if you want to take, you know, take time okay. to go back to the last slide, <laughs> with, um, um, then that's fine too. Well, uh, this slide is also based on national transfer accounts data, but it's taken from a United Nations report, World Population Aging, that came out last year. And what we see here is um, on the top, we have countries you don't need to be able to read these details, I'll explain in a moment, that are labeled public transfer dominant. These are countries in which the elderly, 65 and over, are relying most heavily on public transfers. And then below we have countries that are, they are labeled asset dominant. And the yellow color uh, on the bars indicates labor income. So this shows the extent to which the elderly in different countries are continuing to work after age 65 and, and supporting themselves in part through labor income. Uh, in the public transfer dominant countries, uh, you won't be able to read this little detail, but France and Germany, for example, are there 3% of the consumption is funded by continuing to work in these countries, practically nothing. Uh, whereas in Peru, for example, 23%, or in uh, uh, Uruguay, 18%, uh, uh, and, and so on, uh, are, is covered by continuing to work. Ecuador, 43%. Um, okay, so in these countries with generous pensions in Europe, uh, labor supply ends early. And then assets are the green bars. And uh, you can, it's also the case that these are relatively short. In, and the blue is public transfers. And you can see uh, that uh, for some countries that that's almost the whole story. Uh, so for uh, Sweden here, for example, you can see almost total reliance on public transfers. And Brazil, interestingly, uh, is a case of very heavy reliance on public transfers and Austria and uh, Hungary and so on. But down here, these countries, so this is South Africa, Thailand, Philippines, Indonesia, India, El Salvador, Cambodia. These are countries in which uh, Asset income, which is the green, uh, is mostly 
what the elderly are relying on. And you can see that in some countries, even uh, here, the Philippines, for example, the elderly are net payers of taxes. They pay more in taxes than they take in, in benefits. So there's a big difference big variation. And you can see that uh, across countries, it's going to, different things are going to happen as populations age, depending on these institutional arrangements and cultural values in each country. Okay, let me pass on to some new directions, new work. First, I'll say a word about gender and unpaid care time and introducing time use into NTA. Then NTA by socioeconomic status, then longitudinal NTA, and then generational wealth accounts. So uh, I won't go into the details here, but in, if we wanted to introduce uh, male, female, accounts, and it seemed to make no sense at all to do that without also introducing um, unpaid family labor in the home, which is so much of what females do around the world. Uh, they're productive labor, but it doesn't show up in market uh, the market wages and so on, or, or self-employment. It's not considered self-employment. So here, this is for Senegal, but this sort of uh, analysis and data is available for, oh, probably 40, 45 countries around the world. Um, so here we have hours spent in market work by men and by women. And here we have hours spent in unpaid household time by women and by men. And then here we have total work hours uh, with the men in green and women in blue. And then uh, an attempt is made to, con to monetize uh, the unpaid family labor time and there are different ways of doing it and none of them is very good. But anyway, that's, uh, it, it sort of introduces um, a more complete uh, accounting for national accounts as well as for these uh, national transfer accounts. And once you introduce it on the production side, then you need to take it into account in consumption. Now, when you eat dinner, you're not just eating the ingredients that went into the meal, but you're eating the time that was spent preparing it. And that's part of the NTA methodology. Longitudinal NTA becomes possible because as we saw for the US, we have, um, NTAs estimated every year from 1981 through, I think, 2018 now, plus a few earlier years like 1960. And here you get um, labor income by birth cohort. And you can see some things like the stagnation of labor income for the birth cohorts of 1970, 1980, 1990. You see no uh, no change really here. Uh, whereas later on, you see that each cohort at older ages is earning more than the cohort before it. And at the same time, oddly, you see that on the consumption side down here for cohorts, uh, somehow those cohorts that aren't earning any more are managing to consume more. Well, that's yet to be explored and understood. And so we have this sort of thing done for a number of countries. Uh, here are a few. And uh, similarly on the consumption side, I won't go into more detail there. And then another very important direction I mentioned is introducing socioeconomic status, NTA by socioeconomic status, or by other sort of subgroup. And uh, here we have just done for Colombia. Now, unfortunately, there's a different vertical scale for every one of these graphs, but this is um, females and males with no education, uh, with primary education, with secondary education, and with tertiary. And what we're looking at is pension benefits. So here you see that males and females with no education receive similar pension benefits 
of 800K and whatever the units are. If we compare that to those with tertiary education, first of all, there are big uh, differences between males and females now, but uh, the peak uh, pensions are now about 30 times as great as the peak pensions for uh, those with no education. And you can look at many things like public education, uh, you can look at the tax side as well as the benefit side, and you can look at uh, private expenditures as well by socioeconomic status. You can see to what extent higher income uh, households are paying for private education for their kids. There are very distinctive patterns in Latin America and so on. I won't uh, say more about that now. But I, that's a very important direction which uh, NTA is going into. Latin America has gone a long way and Europe so has done as well. Here's South Africa where we have differences in labor income by race. Um, the dotted gray line is the national average. The blue line is white. The red line is Asian. The dashed blue is colored, and the yellow is African. There's stark differences. And of course, we could look at everything in this way in South Africa. These are courtesy of Mornay Oosterhuizen. And then finally, we have generational wealth accounts. Uh, I'm not going to show any graphs there, but the idea is to trace what a generation gets from birth to death and including uh, bequests it receives and including uh, what it received in education and then the wealth it holds at different ages, what it pays in taxes over its lifetime and what it receives in government benefits and so on. Um, and what distinguishes this from, um, there's a, something in economics called generational accounts is that uh, well, it's much more comprehensive and we have private uh, uh, transfers included as well as government transfers. So this is something we've done for the US and the UK and we're beginning to do for other countries, but it's very data and time intensive. Now I'm going to wrap up and say, uh, first of all, as I tried to emphasize the economic consequences of aging uh, depend very much on country specific conditions. So is the economy open or closed to trade and capital markets? Do people start work early or late? Do they retire early or late? Do the elderly rely on asset income or on transfers to fund their consumption? How high are savings rates? How great are asset holdings relative to labor income? How important are private and public transfers to children and the elderly? Uh, so these are things that are measured in NTA and that help us distinguish uh, between the, what uh, population aging will mean. Of course, we... Uh, we realize that uh, developing countries are probably going to be moving in the direction of the now developed countries. And that gives rise to other ways of thinking about these problems. Japan, for example, in many ways now looks indistinguishable from a European country in terms of its public transfer system. The old reliance on the family has largely evaporated and the elderly go to uh, uh, nursing homes and so on as they do in the West. Um, that may not be true of every uh, country, uh, every developing country, once developing country, uh, but we'll see. Now, let me say a couple of words about Israel, uh, but this is really just summarizing what, I've, summarizing what I've already said. Israel is highly unusual in relation to the topic I've been talking about. Fertility has been high for many decades relative to other high-income countries. This has brought high child dependency and low, low old age dependency. 
Fertility is falling and population is aging, but the future effects seem to be offsetting, even when we weight them by the different costs of children and the elderly and by labor income. But this is only true on average, and individual public programs for children and the elderly will all be heavily affected in coming decades. And so it's important to consider policy options in advance. Should retirement age be raised? Well, it's already, I don't know what formal retirement age is, but uh, labor supply at older ages is still pretty high. But I think probably, yes, it will need to go higher. It's going to need to go higher, in my view, almost everywhere, uh, and particularly in Europe. What should be done with um, the relaxing government budgets for public education as child dependency, child, uh, the share of children in the population declines? Uh, well, one could continue to spend those funds and raise the quality of public education, or you could uh, save money and use it to pay for rising pension costs. Uh, there are questions like that. There are certainly going to be fiscal pressures on the healthcare system and on long-term care. Many of these issues can be explored at least in an, in an initial way using NTA data, but of course uh, you have experts in each of these uh, sectors who will have far more detailed knowledge. These are pressing problems and they're all concealed behind that flat average impact that was so striking. Well, thank you very much and uh, that's what I got to say. Thanks again, Ron. Um... Um, so we're now going to uh, open up to, um, to a discussion bet between the three of us. And I, but, but before we do, um, I, I want to remind um, the listeners, the viewers, that, um, that if you have questions, please, you know, please write them in the chat. We're, we're, we are collecting them and um, um, they will be given to our speakers as we, as we proceed. Um, okay. So Ron and Herb, I want to. So I want to start off with something, something general, which is, um, which of course you know leads leads into Israel specific things. But, um, and and the general question is, um, is there such is there such a such a thing as an ideal age structure? Like if you you know if you could choose <laughs> like choose your stable population, like you want it for your society, you know, like what's you know what is the ideal age structure? Should answer it. Or, uh, yeah, well, well, there is. <laughs> Run over. There is an ideal age structure. If you take as given uh, these age profiles, you, you can calculate an age, ideal age profile for the public sector, which tends to be one with high fertility and few elderly. That uh, the, These are stable populations. You, you, you can't just. Uh, put everyone in the working ages, but you play with fertility and mortality. Um, so, yes, uh, we, we published the whole NTA uh, project, published a paper in science in 2014, in which we, uh, which was titled something like, is fertility too low or something of the sort. And uh, what we concluded was, well, if you, if you took a perspective of a government budget, uh, then you would be something like the Israeli uh, Probably for, if you use the whole labor income and consumption setup, then something below replacement level fertility is ideal in the sense of um, maximizing the support ratio. And if you also take into account savings and capital accumulation and so on, then uh, it's even somewhat lower than just below replacement level fertility. But if you look at um, the public sector, then generally something like two and a half or three births per, per woman is, is ideal. 
Um, I, my, my comment here, it's, it's, it's strange, um, but, but uh, everything is, um, I don't know if it's back to the future or back to the past, but as I mentioned, demography got set up because of a fear of overpopulation. And the problem remains that uh, I don't know what the limit is, but we can't keep growing forever. <laughs> so as Ron just said, fertility is going to have to decline. That is to say it's declined in much of the world and one way or another, it's going to have to decline elsewhere. And the problem is, is that that does limit the range of age structures available to us. And so the age structures we're going to be choosing among are probably not the optimal age structures that during the transition period we've experienced or could imagine. So it's going to be in a choice among some unappealing options is, is, uh, is my only comment here. Um, to, no, to the to the extent that we can we can choose any of this stuff, right? I mean, one of the, one of the principles in 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 population studies is as much as governments over the decades have tried to encourage or discourage people from having kids, um, um, the people in their bedrooms end up doing doing um, <laughs> whatever it is they want. Well, except um, in yeah. except in, except in China. I mean, they did choose in China and. Uh, sure. You know, and, that, and, and that's why I wanted a little shout out to what's happened there. I was uh, just making a point in the chat a little bit that, um, you know, again, this is distasteful to talk about. People don't like to talk about it, but uh, the uh, elderly in China, it seems to me, just as a one-time participant observer, now just an observer, are really going to be in a lot of trouble moving forward because it is indeed a society that does not necessarily need to respond to people in function of their numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it doesn't look good in China for the elderly. So, okay, um, so Herb, so, so Herb, Herb, if I might. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so China certainly made a decision going down, but they also made a decision to raise it. <laughs> and that turned out to be kind of pushing, pushing on a piece of string because their pronatalist policies have not been very effective. Uh, com completely. They could learn from Israel, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it if, it, if the only country in the world that we can teach something to is China, then, then um, no, I mean, like, that's something. Um, um, <laughs> but, but that does, you know, that does lead, like, lead to the question, are there things, you know, um, I mean, are there things that the, um, the Israeli case can, um, I mean, can teach European countries? It, it's, not, it's not fully clear why fertility is high here. I mean, you know, Herb and I were, like, we're on a podcast, we, we, um, I mean, chat informally about this at, at some level, but it's, um, but there have been, I mean, there have been efforts in Europe to raise fertility to, you know, to what you say are basically the ideal levels of 1.8, 1.9 kids per woman. And they've large, largely been unsuccessful, certainly in Southern European countries. Um, but moving beyond that, are there things that we can learn, learn from the Israeli case? Well, I mean, in, in some ways, um... You know, so, so I'm speaking from France. I mean, the French are pretty proud of the fact that, uh, um, you know, I don't know whether you want to call this a Southern or a Northern European country, but uh, the, the total fertility is not so different than it is in the United States. Uh, as in Israel, there's a fair amount of subvention of, um, I realize it's not high in Israel, but it's high relative to other places. In France, they do subvene um, larger families. It does seem to work. Uh, as in Israel, some of the higher fertility is because of uh, segregation in the population, but not as much as in Israel. Um, you, you, it, it does seem that you can 
do some things. And then certainly as you look in Northern Europe, um, people would point out the more uh, support there is for um, women having um, some control over the trade-off between childcare, childbearing and work, um, the more uh, you can keep fertility at something near a replacement level. I mean, I, I, I think that's doable. Um, you know, I think sort of looking at Italy and Spain and Greece kind of makes us crazy about, you know, what can happen, you know, what, what <laughs> does happen. But if you look at Sweden or France, um, from a policy standpoint, like with Israel, you can keep fertility higher. If you look at Britain or the U.S. in a laissez-faire way, you can keep, um, you know, by, by essentially, well, I, I'm not going to go into that, but, but there are different ways to get to the same place. So how, how, how is it that I, I think I heard in the introduction that uh, Susan made that uh, there was a story of a Israeli woman in tech who had five children and so on and so forth. How, how do women negotiate uh, work and, and fertility and household care and uh, so on? Or is it because the men are completely uh, sharing everything or uh, how was it done? Um, um, yeah, it's a it's a great question that we've been struggling with for quite a while. Um, there there seem to be a number of factors, and um, it's it's not all state support. I mean, there is some state support, but the, I think I think on this on this side we're going to come back to um, um, to that you know uh, um, black box that um, we always used to talk about. It's a, it's something cultural. Um, there are strong pronatalist norms which are tied up in both the way that families in interact, that you see it around you a lot, there are lots of people with kids, um, institutionally things are set up to support it, so we have very, very high, I mean, very high rates of labor force participation um, for Jewish women, um, um, but many of them are, are when they have young kids, they're in, in the labor market but not working full time. Um, so, so there's a whole set of things which, um, you, you know, which go to, to uh, supporting this and then, um, you know, at the upper ages as well, it, it's, um, it's, it's uh, facilitated by a, a healthcare system which, which, uh, which provides, you know, full um, reproductive um, um, treatments, which, which has only a marginal effect on fertility. But I think it has it has more than a marginal effect on the symbolism of, 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 all, of all this. Um, but you know, I mean, it's a big question, and um, let me let me come back to to, to, to something else though, and then um, this will be, I think, the final question. Then I want to open up to the general Q and A. Is um, um, Herb? So you you know the way that you you take this whole issue of age structure is into into things like. Uh, um, generational capture and it's a broader set of effects um, um, like would there be something which you would insert in the NTA project expanded to you know to try to look at at um, look you know um, systematically at, at the effects of age structure on on political outcomes and political choices no, no, I, 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 I adore what uh, Ron and Andy and their collaborators have done. Um, I, you know, it, it was on purpose that I grabbed the text. Ron knows everything I said. He, it's in there. Um, they, they, they are treading very carefully. I, Ron, I'm sorry, I'm putting words in your mouth now, but I mean, I, I've, I've, you know, I had a, no end of uh, lunches in Hawaii with Andy. I uh, read their manuals. Um, they know these issues. Um, what I like about what they've done is, is it gives us a framework for what's possible. Uh, all I've tried to do is pick up on the fact that there is this larger 
structure, whether it is the problem of generational capture in the transition, you know, over time, or whether it is just whatever I call it, the immediacy or the selfishness of the now, that is highly likely to make intelligent planning difficult. And we need to remember that. But now I'll leave it to Ron. It, it's there. Andy knows it. Ron knows it. It's there. Ron, is it there? <laughs> I, I don't want to say anything. <laughs> well, there you go. I'm happy to. <laughs> um, well, I. <clears throat> it is. It is very hard to see exactly where things are going. We have these cut and dried age profiles and so on, but they raise plenty of questions. One of the questions is this um, difference between, well, the role of public pensions and public transfers to the elderly, uh, so generous in Europe and Latin America uh, versus elderly who are living on their assets. Now, the thing is, in Europe, the elderly are living on the public transfers and they're saving their assets, but they're going to die someday. Their assets are going to go to their children. And in those countries where the elderly are consuming their assets, and so their children don't have to pay higher taxes now, perhaps, uh, the bequests are gonna be smaller as a consequence. And it's, it's very hard to see the downstream consequences. It's easy enough to see what's happening right now, today, but it's hard to see where all this is headed in, in the longer term. And not to mention how people are going to be modifying their behavior in more radical and dramatic ways. It's very hard to imagine a, a society where people are living to uh, 90 or 95 on average and still retiring as in, in parts of Europe, but at 60 or below. I just can't imagine it. Uh, how can people look their children in the face uh, or younger people that they pass on the street? Um, but okay, we'll see. All right. Um, well, thank you. Well, I, I guess before I end, we we turn it over. One of the things which I did um, yesterday was I looked looked at the age profiles of a bunch of countries to check not only what to, not only you know what percentage of the voting voting age population is older than fifty five. So in Germany, it's about forty eight percent. Here, it's about thirty one percent. So you know, so the weight of the weight of voting age is very different. But it's not only that, it's when you look at the upcoming voters. So in, in um, um, Germany, 25% um, of, the, of the population is age, age 25 or less. Um, here it's 60%. So for, you know, really? you think about a multi-party political system where, where the long-term strategists, and once in a while in parties there are people who think long-term, that, um, you know, the long-term strategists are thinking, okay, let's, let's establish a reputation, a platform. We, we are going to go for the young vote. Going for the young vote in Germany makes, like, makes no demographic sense at all. Going for a young vote in the US <laughs> uh, makes more sense. Going for one here, it makes complete sense. So, uh, I mean, there are, you know, there are, like, there are ways to, 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 um, um, that, that I think this, I mean, this has implications both for the sorts of policy choices which you end up making as a solution to some of the problems which you've, um, which you are putting putting your finger on, um, and with that, um, I want to to open this up to questions from the audience. And can somebody tell me how to do that? Viora. Great. Hello. Yes, and thank you. We have a number of questions um, from the audience, so I'll just start sharing them with our panelists. Um, Ron, what are the effects of immigration on the demographic story and on future um, national transfer account projections? Well, 
for the most part, immigration does not have as much effect on the population age distribution as our intuition leads us to expect. Because uh, before you know it, the, el the immigrants are elderly themselves and uh, their fertility levels adjust rapidly to uh, the general uh, population fertility level. And uh, so the effects are often exaggerated, I think. That's not to say there's no effect. And um, looking at the role of immigrants in relation to uh, the fiscal stability of the public sector in the US, I did a lot of research uh, and th there, there's been quite a bit of work uh, in recent years. And uh, yes, immigrants are a net positive. Um, they're very costly in terms of not their education, but their children's education. Uh, but uh, there's a longer term payoff. And um, well, in the US, there's, there, there's a very positive impact at the federal level and a somewhat negative, smaller negative impact at the state and local level. Um, I think that's a fairly typical uh, kind of finding for uh, immigration. All right, um, great. Um, you know, we have a question out for Herb Smith um, from Shmuel Yerushalmi. Uh, will state institutes be ready for the change in age structure towards an increasing the older population? And how will they manage with providing social services to this changing age group? Yeah, so uh, I'm skeptical. Uh, th this this really is the nub of uh, what I'm pointing out here, which is is that um, states tend to need to react in the cross section, in the moment, um, and that leads to a lot of cynicism uh, and. Um, Th th this this to me is where where a great where a great difficulty lies. I I've already talked about the China situation where I think uh, the Chinese uh, uh, ruling party is very unlikely to um, do what needs to be done for the elderly population that they've created in the uh, uh, in the near or middle term. Um, beyond that. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's it's the the. I, I really think that the political circumstances matter a lot. It's funny. I learned this uh, long ago from reading a great dissertation. It was Alex Weinreb's dissertation um, when I was on his dissertation committee a few years ago at Penn. He had a great treatment of um, changes in uh, use of family planning and fertility in Kenya that had very little to do with any of the demographic situation and had an immense amount to do with who was in control of um, handing out um, access to family planning and so on. I think as demographers, we tend to underestimate the extent to which political um, uh, decisions that come about for all kinds of reasons in the now um, can uh, greatly reshape um, you know, all kinds of economic futures for different age groups. And again, the whole business of shutting down economies for the COVID virus is just an, you know, an amazing illustration of how things can happen so quickly for political reasons uh, in real time. So the answer is, is I think it depends on political factors more than demographic factors. You know, I think on that, we're, we're getting a number of questions um, related to the same um, kind of topic, um, particularly for, for Israel. Um, and this, these come from Neil and Anat Gafni. Um, for the question about Israel being as flat as a pancake, um, taking into account the uneven income distribution and productivity, um, is there consideration that the support ratio model um, for Israel should consider differences in the population makeup and change in the makeup, for example, the share of the ultra-Orthodox um, different sectors and how different sectors have very different work patterns um, and age patterns. 
I think, okay, so I'm, I'm a fairly uh, shallow user of the new NTA results, which are very recent and are still preliminary. And um, so I can't really, I, yeah, the differences as they exist today are implicit in those age profiles I showed, but they're averages across everybody. Uh, how that's going to change in the future and so on, I can't say, but Alex may have uh, a lot more to say on, on I mean, that just, than uh, I do, I yeah, think. Yeah, I'll just say briefly that um, these, uh, like this is the first run of estimates where, which are a national average. And just like Ron was talking about the, the uh, future directions of the NTA going, uh, going into, into subnational groups or different, different sorts of groups, so the long-term plan is to do it for, for the composite groups of the Israeli population too. But for, but for right now, the, that, that flat as a pancake, it just glosses over, smooths over all, all differences, um, um, which are clearly you know, very, very substantial in Israel, as most of us know. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that was my sense from long ago hearing uh, Eli Berman talk about it. And I thought about that. I mean, I thought, you know, there's quite a difference between having a 33-year-old paying in taxes and the difference between you paying a 33-year-old uh, basically uh, for, for their wife to stay home and uh, have kids and for them to be studying um, Talmud all day long. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it... it somehow you're going to have to take that into account in Israel um, uh, because uh, according to Berman's papers, uh, a great deal of that extra fertility is because of the uh, subsidy that allows people to stay out of the labor force. Um, so it's a, uh, I'm about to use a word I don't really mean. It's pernicious if your desire is to raise revenue. If your desire is to build a Jewish society, it's not pernicious. I'm just pointing out these are choices. Alex, if I could just say one thing quickly, what's changed very significantly since Eli uh, uh, published his paper in the QJE is that female participation in the Haredi world has changed drastically, drastically. So the wives are no longer staying home and, and, and raising the kids. They're going out to the workforce, a lot of it part-time, but that's a huge change that's happened since his paper. Thank you, I appreciate that. I need to read more. <laughs> you know, I think talking about another kind of hypothetical um, looking forward, um, what do you think, Ron, are, is going to be the effect of greater levels of automation and productivity, specifically the move towards artificial intelligence, along with another very different policy response, which is universal basic income? How would that affect the support ratio model we're seeing? Oh, yeah. Well... I mean, there's so many difficult questions around that that go far beyond anything we have attempted to do in NTA. But I think they're very important uh, questions. Now, I didn't emphasize that uh, use of NTA in which we try to estimate increasing capital intensity and how that uh, is driven by population aging and so on. But there are implicit assumptions in that approach that uh, you can substitute capital for labor. What does that mean in the case of uh, elder care, for example? Well, uh, I guess it means robots and uh, things like that, uh, or maybe more sophisticated uh, devices for uh, monitoring elderly trying to live alone with disabilities and that sort of thing. Uh, then there's the whole question about whether it, you know, this, uh, the spread of AI and so on, is that going, uh, artificial intelligence, is that going to be a boon for society or is it going to make jobs obsolete and uh, lead to the need for universal income? I, uh, no, I think they're great questions. I just don't have any uh, special insight about them myself. I I puzzle about the, these questions. Mm -hmm. But but there, you know, in NTA we look at what's here now, and we don't really have any particular 
advantage in looking at what the future is going to be like other than as driven by the demography. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'd like to remind if anybody has any questions to just write them in the chat and, um, and, we'll, and we'll get to them hopefully. Um, another question is related from Eliyahu uh, Ben Moshe is related to the politics of uh, the situation to, to some extent, but how is the readiness of uh, labor force active population to subsidize the non-labor force part, um, participating groups? And I think this is particularly relevant for Israel. How would that likely affect the politics of the actual redistribution of wealth um, when the labor force uh, active population is requested to pay more taxes when they receive less public services? Is this for me or for Herb? <laughs> it's for you, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> for either of you. Well, I mean, I, I think. First of all, um, I did, I looked at uh, the social security program by race ethnic group in the US. And you can see, I mean, the white population is much older and has had lower fertility and so on than uh, the Latino population or the African American population. And so effectively, um, the non-white, that is uh, the minority population in the US has been making net transfers in to support elderly white uh, people. Now, uh, this is true and it's, it's tens of billions of dollars per year, but it's also true that looked at longitudinally, those groups get a higher rate of return through the social security system. So it's a, a conflict between the cross section and the longitudinal uh, perspective. For some reason, it hasn't become a big political issue in the US. I don't really know why it hasn't, but um, maybe it's just that people don't realize it. Now in Israel, I guess it's, front and center visible to everyone. But that's not so different than this business of people retiring at uh, 58 or 60 and then expecting to live another 30 years and have other people support them. Uh, well, somehow that doesn't lead to a lot of outrage in the US or in most countries either. I don't exactly understand why. But there, at least you look at yourself moving through the life cycle and you may be paying high taxes now and working hard, but then you think, ah, well, I'll have 30 years of going fishing or something and it'll be wonderful. But when you're looking at really different groups within the population, then you're no longer looking at different ethnic groups or uh, whatever the terminology is for in, in Israel, um, you're no longer looking at, at different positions on the same life cycle. You can't say, oh, I'm working now and then I'll be retired later. Uh, it, it, it appears that there are some groups that are not working when they're young and uh, other groups that are, and that's not gonna change over the life cycle. That's a different story. Um, and it, it is amazing and it's something we all need to learn about because it, it, it differs in different places, a, a, a quick, anecdote here in France, I remember a few years ago, um, you know, everybody gets up in arms when the government tries to increase the retirement age. People take to the streets and so on. I'm sitting in a cafe. Of course, the uh, demonstration ends. Everybody comes in to have a cigarette and drink uh, uh, and have a drink. Uh, I'm looking and there's, I, I, I was just charmed. I ended up paying for their drinks. It was a uh, table of young people. They were all out protesting so that the um, uh, retirement age was not increased. I thought, what a nice thing to do for their, but, but <laughs> then over time, the more I, time I spent in France, the more I realized that it's really about social stratification. That is to say, the people who are in the system take the life cycle view. The young people know as long as they do their homework, get their scores, get in the system and get out, they can maintain this life that they're in. 
So, um, so much of the tension is between people who are in the system and people who are out. People who are in the system can take a long life cycle perspective. People who are out of the system don't like it. Then of course in the US and other populist places, um, you know, politicians manipulate these things uh, in the cross section because they're not informed in the way that Ron just informed us to create tensions between groups even when the facts are, are the reverse. So it, it's very place dependent. You have, to, you have to really understand the society and the politics of the place and the actors to really figure out how this is gonna play out. And that's why I'm gonna stop talking now. I just think that we all need to be really intelligent and not assume things uh, on, on, on um, basic relations they don't always obtain. Thank you. Um, one, one other last question um, from Yossi Shavit. Um, do you see, and this is for you also, Herb Smith, um, Herb Smith, do you see an age gradient in the tendency to vote for Trump? We have our elections coming up soon where you talked about age as a factor um, and BB-ness and yeah, well, of course, is there an age gradient there that, you know, that you're aware of? Well, listen, you guys can probably read the same polls I do. It sounds as if uh, it, Trump has managed to get rid of his uh, support among older people in the US. He, uh, he, he's no longer the candidate of the elderly in the US. So the whole question now is just uh, how people are able to vote and how the votes get counted. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Um, 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 as a longtime resident of Philadelphia, I'm, I'm always fascinated to hear Netanyahu because, uh, like me, he's a suburban Philadelphian. But beyond that, I don't know very much. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, um, let me have a quick, like a quick follow up um, um, about the. Um, about the group level differences. And one of, I think one of the most um, um, influential book level treatments for demography in general in the US over the last couple of years is, um, is Anne Case and Angus, Angus Beaton's Deaths of Despair um, and, and the Future of Capitalism. Um, 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 and I think one of the things which they, which they, which they describe there is, is, is the extent to which um, to which the poor are increasingly supporting the rich. Um, um, so, uh, so, you know, so again, it underscores the need to, 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 to break some of these estimates down by, by social class, even, even if you're taking a life course perspective, uh, be, you know, because the life courses are different for people in different, different social, social positions. Um, but with that, um, 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 thank you very, very much, Ron and uh, and Herb. Um, um, Ron, in particular, you're talking from Berkeley, so it is it is one thirty in the morning. Thank you, thank you so much for staying up and uh, and uh, sharing sharing your insight with us, Herb. Herb, thank you for getting up earlier and um, moving moving down to your basement in in, in Paris. Um, and thank you to all the audience members who sent questions, and we will proceed. Um, with the rest of the conference. Thanks again.